Hi, I'm Dr. Billy Wu, and in this video we'll be exploring what are redox flow batteries and why are they important. First of all, it's important to note that we're about to undergo a massive transition in the way we generate electricity from traditional fossil fuel sources to renewables, which will mainly be in the form of solar and wind. Now, while solar and wind deployments have the advantage of being low carbon energy sources, there are a number of challenges. Firstly, they're relatively inflexible in terms of the fact that it's not easy to simply increase power supply on demand. Secondly, supply is intermittent in that wind blows and the sun shines inconsistently and often out of alignment with electricity demand, meaning that excess capacity would be required. And finally, there's increasing amounts of wasted electricity when there's excess of supply and the grid can't handle this. This leads to what is known as curtailment. So, motivated by these challenges, there are many now starting to deploy energy storage systems alongside renewable generation to help balance the supply and demand issues. One energy storage solution is the redox flow battery, which is similar to the lithium ion batteries that we find in our mobile phones and electric vehicles. However, there's a number of big differences. In a lithium ion battery, the amount of energy stored is related to the amount of solid active material we have. Here, graphite is normally used as a negative electrode, and a transition metal oxide is normally used as a positive electrode, and lithium ions move between the two electrodes when charging and discharging. In a redox flow battery, the amount of energy stored is related to the amount of liquid electrolyte, which is often contained in external tanks. This electrolyte is then pumped through a flow battery stack, where power can either be put into or taken out of the fluids by changing their oxidation states. This difference in design therefore makes flow batteries quite flexible and modular. If you need more energy, you can increase the size of the tanks. If you need more power, you can add more stacks. Also, because the electrolyte is liquid, the system tends to be extremely durable, giving the system a long lifetime and also extremely safe since many flow batteries use an aqueous or water-based electrolyte. Because of these advantages, we've started to see large-scale flow batteries such as the 8 megawatt hour vanadium flow battery system shown here, which is used to balance renewable electricity generation in Zhangbei, China. Now, if we compare lithium-ion batteries with flow batteries, we can see that the current cost of flow batteries are a bit higher due to the more aggressive development of lithium-ion batteries. However, they've got a clear lifetime advantage because they use liquid electrolytes to store their energy. Beyond lifetime and cost, we can see how the technologies compare against each other on other metrics. In terms of efficiency, lithium ion generally tends to be better. For safety, due to the flammable organic electrolytes used in lithium ion batteries, their safety has always been an issue, whereas the aqueous flow battery systems generally have excellent safety characteristics. The recyclability of lithium-ion batteries generally is poor due to challenges in separating the materials, whereas flow batteries are much better since the electrolytes are already separated. And finally, flow batteries don't compare as well on power capabilities to lithium-ion batteries. However, in some applications, this is less of an issue. Therefore, it's fair to say that flow batteries have the potential to be lower cost, longer lifetime, safer, and more recyclable than lithium-ion batteries. Now, let's dive a bit deeper into what's actually going on inside of a flow battery. We start off by having our electrolytes in two external tanks, which we call the analyte for the negative electrolyte and the catholyte for the positive electrolyte. This is what stores the energy. However, to put in energy or take it out, we have to pump this electrolyte into a flow battery stack, which has an anode compartment for the analyte and a cathode compartment for the catholyte. These two fluids are separated by an ion exchange membrane, which allows charge carriers to move between the two electrolytes, but restricts mixing. Power can then either be applied or extracted from the flow battery by changing the oxidation state of the electrolyte fluids. This is where we add or remove electrons from the electrolyte. Now, whilst the membrane is designed to prevent mixing of the two electrolytes, this isn't perfect, and a degree of crossover occurs, which leads to a loss of capacity although in some systems, this can later be rebalanced. Now, if we then look closer at the cross-section of a flow battery cell, we can see various components. On both electrodes, we have a porous carbon electrode, which is often made of carbon paper or carbon felt. 
This provides electronic conduction pathways, but also allows for the electrolyte to infiltrate and diffuse through the cell. These two porous carbon electrodes are separated by an ion exchange membrane, which doesn't allow for electrons or electrolyte to flow through, but it does allow for charge carriers to pass. Now, whilst there are a few options for this, in many cases, this is made from a material called nafion, which is a sulfonated fluoropolymer discovered by DuPont. These components are then sandwiched between two graphite plates, which direct the electrolyte to the reaction sites on the carbon paper. Here, making good liquid tight seals is important for a durable system. Now, whilst we can increase the surface area of a single cell to increase the maximum current, a single cell can only provide around one volt of electrical potential, which is not very practical. Therefore, several cells are stacked together in series to build up the voltage with metal end plates and tie rods used to hold the whole assembly together. This flow battery stack is then integrated into a system with electrolyte, tanks, pumps and electronics to control the system. Now, when we take a closer look at flow batteries, there's actually a broad range of possible chemistries. Generally, this can be broken down into two main categories depending on the active materials used. In one of these, we have a liquid or gas electrode paired with a metal, such as the zinc bromine system. And then we have the liquid liquid systems, such as the all vanadium and iron chromium systems, all of which have had some degree of commercialization. Beyond these chemistries, there are a number of other promising systems which are either under development or at the lab prototype stage, or with different pros and cons. However, to date, only the all vanadium and zinc bromine systems have really gained any appreciable commercial traction. Now, when we're considering a flow battery chemistry, one of the most important aspects is the positive and negative electrolyte. Here, the ideal properties are that it should have a good reactivity for high efficiency, and it should have a large stability window for high lifetime and performance. Therefore, in this plot which shows the different redox couples, we want to pick a pair which have a large difference in voltage and which have high reactivity indicated by the height of the lines. However, one of the problems is that many of these systems are aqueous, i.e. they use water, and therefore we should be careful that certain redox couples could lead to hydrogen or oxygen formation, which leads to poor lifetime. Once we've selected the chemistry, we then need to consider the flow battery components such as membranes and flow fields. Then these are stacked together to build up the voltage and then ultimately integrated into systems with power electronics and control. Now, of the various chemistries available, perhaps the most commercially mature is the all vanadium flow battery. In this system, both the analyte and catholyte are made up of vanadium electrolytes, which is afforded due to the fact that vanadium has four useful oxidation states. In this case, the V4 plus and V5 plus redox couples are used for the positive electrode with a potential of approximately one volt and the V2 plus and V3 plus redox couples are used for the negative electrode with a potential of minus 0.255 volts. When combined together, this therefore gives a system with an open circuit voltage of 1.259 volts. The advantage of this system is therefore high theoretical lifetimes since crossover effects aren't irreversible since vanadium is used on both sides of the battery and can therefore be rebalanced. The redox potential of the V2 and V3 plus anode reactions also means that there's limited hydrogen side reactions leading to higher stability. And given the high relative reactivity of the redox couples, it also means that expensive catalysts aren't often required for operation. The disadvantages of this system, however, include the price volatility of vanadium, most of which is a byproduct of the steel manufacturing process and also the low energy and power densities of the system relative to lithium ion batteries, though this is less of an issue for stationary storage applications. If we expand on the point of vanadium supply, we can see that in 2019, 90% of the supply was sourced from magnetite or titanomagnetite ores through either co-production or primary production methods. This was a 15% increase on the previous year, which resulted in a total global production of over 111,000 tons of vanadium, which was mostly driven by China's increased slag and steel production. When we look closer at this, there are three main methods of vanadium production. Co-production, which accounted for 71% of 2019 production and is derived from the steel industry. 
primary production methods where ores are roasted and processed primarily for the vanadium which accounted for 18% of 2019 production. And finally there are secondary production methods where waste streams such as fly ash and spent catalysts from the oil refining process are used to recover the vanadium. The challenge here is achieving the right level of purity for a long lifetime battery. Now if we look at a zinc bromine flow battery which is the next most popular chemistry this is a slightly different type to the all vanadium system. Here a aqueous electrolyte consisting of zinc bromide salt dissolved in water is used. During charge bromide is converted to bromine to give a voltage of 1.08 volts at a positive electrode and zinc is plated on the negative electrode to give a voltage of negative 0.77 volts. When discharging the battery the reverse reaction occurs with this redox couple giving a voltage of 1.84 volts and given that the deposition reaction occurs at one electrode we call this a hybrid flow battery. The advantage of this system is that the materials are relatively cheap both in terms of the electrolyte and the membrane and the system has a relatively high energy density and voltage for a flow battery meaning that they have found some application in residential energy storage systems where space can be at a bit more of a premium. The disadvantage of this system relative to vanadium flow batteries is that the lifetime is generally lower since there are crossover issues and safety issues can arise through the formation of zinc dendrites and toxic bromine gas which results in slower charge rates and occasional maintenance cycles. And the final flow battery chemistry we'll discuss is the iron chromium system. This is much more similar to the earlier all vanadium system in that liquid electrolyte is used on both sides of the flow battery. On the positive electrode a liquid electrolyte consisting of Fe2 plus and Fe3 plus ions are used with a voltage of 0.77 volts. And on the negative electrode, a liquid electrolyte consisting of chromium 3 plus and chromium 2 plus ions are used with a voltage of negative 0.41 volts. Combined, this therefore gives a cell voltage of 1.18 volts. The advantage of using this system is that both iron and chromium electrolytes are relatively cheap. However, the disadvantage is that the energy density is low and the kinetics of the chromium reaction are also slow, resulting in a large system. Furthermore, the potential of the chromium reaction means hydrogen evolution can readily occur and crossover of dissimilar electrolytes can lead to accelerated and irreversible degradation. Yet, despite these challenges, companies such as Enervolt have attempted to commercialize this technology, though with limited success due to these issues. So, if we were to compare the various technologies, the all vanadium flow battery has clear advantages in terms of lifetime due to effectively having the same type of electrolyte on both sides. However, the use of vanadium has price risk due to the volatility of the raw materials. Yet, despite this, there's already been approximately one gigawatt hour of deployments. With zinc bromine flow batteries, the electrolyte is much lower in cost and the system is more energy dense, making it useful for residential energy storage. However, the zinc deposition reaction can lead to dendrite formation, which could be a safety risk. Here, smaller systems are more common, with approximately 300 megawatt hours of storage deployed. And finally, the iron chromium system in theory has lower costs due to the cheaper electrolyte materials. However, the low activity of the chromium redox couple and the crossover issues has thus far limited its broader deployment. So, to conclude, there's an undoubted increase in renewables generation, which is great. However, deployment of these renewables will likely result in issues around power network stability. Flow batteries have the potential to be a low cost, safer and more durable option than lithium ion batteries. Some of these advantages come from their ability to decouple power and energy with the size of the stacks representing power and the size of the electrolyte tanks representing energy. However, there's quite a few components in the system making them more complex when still requiring scaling. The three main flow battery chemistries currently being commercialized include the all vanadium, zinc bromine and iron chromium flow batteries. Here the all vanadium system is currently the most widely adopted because of advantages in lifetime, however significant improvements are still required and there's still lots of room for innovation in emerging chemistries. So I hope you found this video useful and thank you very much for listening.